Well, it's finally here. Here we go. We are three days away from what has felt like the longest presidential campaign season in history. (laughs) Have you found yourselves asking, will it ever be over? Yeah. When you add up the social media effect, that would probably triple the time that we've actually spent reading and tweeting and posting over this election. However, on Tuesday, praise God, all will be said and done as Americans exercise their rights to have the last word, our vote. Did you know that you get and I get to have the last word? Now, there will be plenty of words that will be spoken after we vote. But in regards to the election itself, the great thing about America is that we still, as citizens, have the privilege and the honor and the opportunity to have the last word. That is not something to take for granted, but something to behold and be thankful for. Amen? There are countries all around this world who are envious of the fact that citizens still today have the opportunity to exercise such a right. This morning I want to speak straight about a few things that have been weighing heavily on my heart. I doubt much of it will be a big surprise to to many of you who, who know me. For others it will probably reveal a little bit how I'm wired how I think about matters of politics and faith. You are free to agree, and you are free to disagree. Because at the end of this message, we're going to still love each other. Amen? I don't come with a lot of answers to solve our political questions. These issues are complex, some convoluted. And many others are just simply corrupt. Personally, it has felt like swimming through toxic waters. I have held my breath at times as I submerged into the cesspool of political muck in hopes of finding something refreshing and hopeful. And many times when I thought I found it, the next day's news seemed to swoop in and take it right away been frustrating. It really has. So I come to you this morning as a fellow seeker of truth and hope in this political, politically polluted environment. But more importantly, I stand before you this morning as one who has been called to follow Christ and who has been appointed as a shepherd among the people of God. Therefore, I will speak to you as your pastor, not as one of the 10,000 political analysts who have entered into our homes, whether voluntarily or involuntarily. I will not stand as another armchair expert or or personal persuader to one particular political agenda. Yes, this election has very high stakes for the future of our country. I believe that, sincerely. I believe that what happens on Tuesday is a turning point on a path that we have been heading down. So for those of you who may think more seriously about political things, I want to assure you that I do not in any way downplay the importance of this election. No, sir. No way. A lot is at stake, not only for our lives, but especially for the lives of the next generation that shall live beyond us unless Jesus comes. And I don't know about you, but I seriously have prayed many times 
that Tuesday morning would be a great day. <laughs> it really would. Can you imagine? Can you just, just, uh, just take it in for a moment? That seemed to bring you hope. Just take it in for a moment. You hear that trumpet sound and you'll go, Thank God! It would be awesome. Yes, some of those stakes are directly aimed at our Christian faith and values, which I believe should be considered as we discern our vote on Tuesday. And I'll get to that in a moment. But before I do, I want to frame this. I believe also that our behavior, our personal conduct is just as important, if even not more important, as we stand before the world representing as Christians the kingdom of God on election day. We do not have permission from the Lord as followers of Jesus to take off our Christian faith, hand it to one of the uh, electoral uh, members who would be working the location, and then walk into the voting booth and cast our vote and then come out and put our Christian cloak back on. We don't have, we don't have that permission from the Lord. If that's how you think, that's not from God. All right? He says, come and follow me always, forever. In every realm of life, we shall be followers of Christ first, and then we are citizens of this nation second. Never get that confused. Yes, it's a privilege to be here. I am proud to be a citizen of these United States of America. I love America but I love God more. And I will be His follower first, and I'll be a citizen here second. So, hear these words from Jesus in John 13. This won't be our main text, but we'll, we'll get there and eventually by Tuesday. All right? I promise you. John 13, 33. Dear children, I will be with you only a little longer Jesus speaking to his disciples here. He says, and as I told the Jewish leaders, you will search for me, but you can't come where I am going. Jesus speaking of his death and his ascension to the Father. Okay? He says in verse 34, so, since that's going to happen, all right, since you can't come where I'm going, you've got to stay here in this place, in this realm, the earth, the world, this culture. Since you can't come with me and you have to stay here, he says, so now I am giving you a new commandment. Love each other. Love each other. Just as I have loved you, you should love each other. Your love for one another will prove that the world to the world that you are my disciples. In the New King James, it says, by this, all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. As followers of Christ, we are to be known by the way we love, not by our political party affiliations. It's important that we frame our lives in this way before we head off to vote on election day. In 1 John chapter 3, verse 10, <coughs> it says, So now we can tell who are children of God and who are children of the devil. Anyone who does not live righteously and does not love other believers does not belong to God. Whew. This is the message, in verse 11, this is the message you have heard from the beginning. We should love one another. We must not be like Cain who belonged to the evil one and killed his brother. And why did he kill him? 
because Cain had been doing what was evil and his brother had been doing what was righteous. So don't be surprised, dear brothers and sisters, if the world hates you. If we love our Christian brothers and sisters, it proves that we have passed from death to life. But if a person who has no love is still dead. Something that has disturbed me during this presidential election cycle is the way I have listened to brothers and sisters in Christ literally rip each other apart over differences of political opinion. It's been sad. I know of people in social media who have unfriended each other because of their political persuasions and opinions. It seems that as long as the issues are political, Christians can use a get-out-of-jail-free card to speak hatefully and unlovingly to each other. You know, the Bible doesn't change when we're speaking of political minors. You know that, right? Our behavior, our com the command of Christ to live righteously and lovingly before the world does not change when we start talking about elections. It does not. And yet, you would think when you look at the way that some Christians are speaking to each other, they would believe differently. And this is modeled for us daily and minute by minute on nearly every TV and radio news program. We watch the so-called experts verbally bash each other and never really listening to each other as they discuss current political issues. And of course, our two presidential candidates have taken campaign debating, debating to an all-time low. Now, I don't, well, this is my opinion. Let me make sure I clarify what's opinion, what is, what. I don't think it really matters what political persuasion you are or which candidate you are for. I don't see how anyone could sit back and say, this has been full of respect and love and compassion. This has been horrific in the way that two grown adults have spoken to and about each other. Do we agree on that? Okay, all right. And it has gotten so nasty. Sherry and I were talking last night uh, or yesterday morning, and we both agreed. We, we haven't really sat down, and matter of fact, she's like, I don't have time, the emotional energy for all of that. And she's a, she's a woman, she kind of, like most women, you just kind of see things black and white. You just, like, she's already made up her mind who she's voting for a long time ago. She's like, I don't need to hear any more news. But one of the things that we both agreed on and we noticed was this. I think a lot of people are going to be really surprised on Tuesday at this election. I, look, well, let me ask you this. Has anyone in here been polled? You've been called? I'm just wondering because I hear about all these polls and I know not a single soul who has been called. It's just befuddling to me. It's like, who are they calling? They haven't called my neighbors. Or, but I'm glad to see that a few people have been called. Praise God, you've been part of the poll. But here's what we observe. This is our opinion. There's been a lot of pe there's a lot of people in this nation who are saying nothing. And the reason that they're saying nothing and and uh, and we know this firsthand from at least I do from some people. They're not going to put their position or their their political preference out on Facebook. Because they don't want to be part of the drama. As soon as you put it out there, it's drama. And you risk losing friends. You risk being criticized and all of this. And, uh, and that's not to say that those of you who have, that you've been wrong in doing it. I'm not saying that at all. I'm just saying 
I think there's a large portion of our population who have said, I'm just going to be quiet and I'll speak loud with a click in the voting booth. That's how I'm going to exercise my voice. Boom. And that makes me feel, that's opinion, that just makes me feel as if there's going to be a lot of um, political experts who are going to be uh, turning in circles on Tuesday night. Like, where did this come from? How did that happen? Like, what? You mean you didn't know? You've only taken five billion polls, but you haven't called but three people in my church. So, how did you know? <clears throat> Wrong with people. The other thing, and, and this is all introduction, we'll get to the meat of the message in a minute. We're framing, we're framing, we're framing. Laying a foundation. The other thing that in the midst of all of this speech that seems to be happening, our children are watching. And they're listening. They're overhearing the news channels that we have on. They're overhearing the phone conversations that we're having. They may even be watching our Facebook conversations. They may, they're certainly hearing how we're speaking in our home to one another. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 1, it says, These are the commands, the decrees, and regulations that the Lord your God commanded me to teach you. You must obey them in the land you are about to enter and occupy. And so God was preparing the people to enter into the promised land. And he says in verse 2, And you and your children and grandchildren must fear the Lord your God as long as you live. It does not say, your children and your grandchildren must fear Donald Trump or Hillary Clinton as long as you live. Even though you might say, well, they should. But it doesn't say that. It says that as we teach our children, we teach them to have a fearful respect. That's what that word means. Is to have a reverence toward God Almighty. Amen? Toward God. As long as you live, if you obey all his decrees and commands, you will enjoy a long life. Amen. That's God's promises. Listen closely, he says in verse 3, Israel, and be careful to obey. Then all will go well with you, and you will have many children in the land flowing with milk and honey, just as the Lord, the God of your ancestors, promised you. Listen, O Israel, the Lord is your God, the Lord alone, and you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your strength, and you must commit yourselves wholeheartedly to these commands that I am giving you today. Verse 7, repeat them again and again to your children. Listen, repeat them again and again to your children. Talk about them when you are at home and when you are on the road, when you are going to bed and when you are getting up. Tie them to your hands and wear them on your forehead as reminders and write them on your doorpost of your house and your, on your gates. Amen? Friends, our children need to know the way of the Lord more than they need to know the way of a political party. A political party is not going to save our children's souls. A political party is not going to redeem our nation back to God. They may be able to represent some principles or whatever that may get us there, but what, the, what this country needs, and, and again, this is not, I want you to hear carefully, this is not a slam against any of the two uh, or one of the political candidates. What this nation needs is not to make America great again. What this nation needs is for the church to be great again. That's what we have. We have a church problem, not an American problem. If the church 
would rise up and be great again. Everything changes. Everything changes. If we literally take our values, our Christian principles and values, and not only into the voting place, but, but into the political arena, things will change. And what frustrates so many of us is that we hear promise after promise after promise from this candidate and this candidate and this candidate that yes, I am a Christian. Yes, I represent these values. And as soon as we elect them, we're disappointed. It's like, where was your backbone, pal? Why didn't you stand up for what you said you would represent in Christ's name? And we're frustrated. People wonder in the news, they're just like, why is America angry? Again, poll people in this congregation, please. I'll tell you, come and talk to me and I'll tell you why we're angry. We're angry because Christians have sat down on the job for personal gain in many ways. Sold their soul to something that didn't represent this book. It's time for people in this congregation to stand up and enter the political arena. We need some of you to start serving on our school boards, city councils, board of supervisors. We need to not just sit back and pray and hope that everybody else who's out there is going to get it together. If God is calling us, and someone asked me, one of the pastors who um, was at the Franklin Graham prayer rally in Richmond, he asked me a question a few weeks ago as we as pastors were gathered together, and Franklin Graham asked us to sign a covenant. And on that covenant, it said, one of the things that he publicly asked us to respond to, that if, if God called us, and at one point he even pointed out spiritual leaders, if God has called us to serve in the political arena, would we be willing to say yes? And so one of the pastors said, I'm just curious. <laughs> if you sign that covenant, are you guys open to that? And I said, yeah, I've already settled that in my heart years ago. That if the Lord calls, I'm going to go. I'm not saying I'm going anywhere, but I will go. If I'm asking you, I've got to be open myself. So, what we're, what we're dealing with is also, I think, maybe a more important issue in this election let me get back to where I was, kind of strayed there a minute, is that our children are watching and they're listening. And what are they listening to? Are they hearing more of the Word of God than they are CNN and Fox News? Are they hearing more of God's Word and, and seeing His truth modeled out in front of them more than they are seeing what people think and their opinions on Facebook? Snapchat. That just made me cool with all the young people. But it's true. What are we modeling for our children? Because they're listening. I believe this election cycle has exposed something deeply troubling about America's Christianity. For me, it has exposed the level of spiritual immaturity that has been shocking in some ways. Shocking and somewhat disappointing. It would appear that we are not as anchored in the teachings of God's Word as maybe we assume. We have been persuaded more by personalities than we have by seeking God's mind on things that matter most to Him. This election has exposed the worst of us, and for that, I am grateful. Ashamed, but grateful. 
Because by exposing it, the Lord has caused us to take a deeper look. If we're not as anchored, what can we do about it? I've had conversations with our elder team and with our staff about this very question. They'll tell you. And I said, what, what are we doing? Are we doing enough to anchor our church in God's Word? And so we're, we're wrestling with that question, and the Lord is speaking what we think may be some revelation to that. So, what might I say to you this morning as you head to the voting polls this Tuesday? Well, before I get out of the introduction and into the meat of this message, I want to set two things straight before we go. I will not tell you who to vote for. Not going to do it. And I will respect your personal choice of whom you vote for. And I will love you regardless. I will not allow this election to determine our relationship. I don't think that is the way of Christ at all. We had a as many of you know, I lead a group of young adults. I love that group. They're very honest and open. We had a conversation on Thursday, and I said, we were talking about spiritual maturity, and I said, okay, listen, I have a question for you. How are you, as the millennial generation, navigating all of this political stuff that we find ourselves in? Here is what was beautiful at our table. We had several different opinions and positions on the subject about, you know, how they were going to vote. Several said, you know, this is who I'm voting for and this is why. And, and it was different from some of the others at the table. And here was the beauty, and I pointed out the end. I said, isn't it great that we can sit here and we can talk about this, and we're going to still love each other. We're still friends. Isn't that a miracle? We're not standing up and shouting at each other. We're not going crazy on each other. We're going to still walk out of this room being the life group that God has called us to be. We're going to still walk out of here loving and respecting each other. It was awesome. It was awesome. And then I had a conversation with another pastor the following day. Not, not a pastor in Cornerstone, but a local pastor. He was in the cafe. We were talking about some things, and he said, you know, he said, uh, I think it was last week. No, it was this week. He said he was leading a small group of an intergenerational group, and he brought up the subject of politics in the election. <clears throat> and he said there was a young man who was sharing a young adult who was sharing his heart and sharing his position. He said, and then there was an older citizen who just went off on this young man. Told him everything that was wrong about his thinking. Just annihilated him with his political position. And he said, it was everything I could do to bring some kind of peace and order into that room. And we both stood there as pastors lamenting over that this is where we are. This is where we are in the body of Christ, that we can't even have conversation about differences of opinion on things without destroying each other. So we need another way. My ability to walk in loving fellowship with you is not and will not be determined by how we vote on Tuesday. I just want you to know that in case you were wondering. I cannot find any evidence in the Bible that our unity is or should be determined by such a thing. Our unity is in Christ and Christ 
alone. In Christ, in Christ alone. Now, in saying all that, I, I want to go this far this morning because I think if we're going to share the truth, we just need to be very open and very honest about it. Okay? Is that fair enough? So, you hear what I have just framed for you. Now, here's what I want you to know. I believe that this is probably the clearest election of two opposing belief systems and value systems. You, you can't get it any clearer. And what I want, this is how I want to tell you how to approach your vote. I think both candidates are extremely flawed. Okay? Now, you can debate whether, you know, they got some good sides, you, you know, one's better than the other or whatever, but I think generally across the board, we all agree that both candidates, we could have done better. I mean, we're all in shock. It's like, how in the world did we end up with this? And I've often wondered, I've asked that question. Again, here's my opinion. I think that God has given us two extremely flawed personalities so that we can look much deeper. Because if you're voting on personality, God help you. I mean, they're both in trouble. Now, and I know that many people have tried to spiritualize one and the other and say, well, you know, there are biblical examples and whatever. That all may be true. I don't know. I, I don't have quite that insight. But here's what I know. These are just the facts, okay? And when I say this, you're going to probably say, well, we know who you're voting for. Look, you can't separate the facts from this election. And so, again, I'm not telling you who to vote for. But I can tell you this, just on a few of the issues. Sanctity of human life. Now, here in our church, we are very, very pro-life. We believe that the Scripture honors life. We do not support abortion. We support uh, comfort care because they are a ministry that is protecting the life of the unborn and encouraging moms and dads to bring their babies to full term and if they're not willing to care for them, to put their children into adoption. We have people in our church who work in the adoption and foster care uh, industry. And so we, are, we believe in the sanctity of all human life. All right? The two political, one of the two main political parties is going to be president. All right? Now, if your conscience and your conviction is to vote third party, I respect you. As a matter of fact, one of the people in our life group gave, gave a great position for um, voting third party. I respect that. Okay? I respect that. However, the two main parties, one of which is going to represent our nation as president, are very polarized on that issue. The Republican Party, under uh, Donald Trump, believes in the sanctity of human life and at least restricting abortion, and he's gone as far as saying we want to nullify. The Democratic Party says we believe in a woman's right to choose. We believe that abortion needs to be protected and even goes as far as saying late-term abortion is an important choice that every woman needs to have at her disposal. Now, I'm not giving you an opinion on either one, but you need to know those are two very polarizing issues. 
as a Christian, I can't just sit back and say, well, I wonder which policy would be best for the nation. I have to approach it. I wonder what God's Word says about that issue. That's just what we have to do. So you can't, you can't separate that, people. So I encourage you, remove the personalities and look at the platforms. Look at the policies. Um, let's look at marriage. We in our church will not sanctify a same-sex marriage. We've had people email us, ask us questions. I don't hate those in the LGBT community. I am called to love them as much as I am called to love you. But we believe that the Scripture is very clear that marriage is between one man and one woman. All right? Okay. These two political platforms are totally opposed to each other in that, on that issue. They can't be further apart. The Republican Party believes that we need to uh, protect heterosexual marriage and repeal laws that have even been put in place by the Supreme Court to allow same-sex marriage. That's what they say. I'm not saying that. That's what they say. The Democratic Party has a totally different platform view of that. They believe that same-sex marriage should be the law in every state in the Union, my friend, right across America, which it is now. Uh, they will protect the Supreme Court ruling of, uh, what was that, last year, to protect same-sex marriage. There's even been efforts in our current administration to force upon churches and pastors to perform same-sex marriage and to lose their 501c3 um, privilege, nonprofit privilege, if they refuse to do so. There's a pastor in, I believe, Georgia, who was just subpoenaed two weeks ago or a week ago for all transcripts, all copies of all of his sermons because he held a political position in his town. They had found out that he was opposed to same-sex marriage and he was fired. And now they've come after his sermon. It's coming. It's here. Religious liberty versus the LGBT agenda. The Republicans have stated that they believe in the freedom for freedom for faith to influence our views of morality. Okay? The Democratic Party, the LGBT agenda, uh, they have stated should overshadow religious conviction. It's just a fact, folks. Remove the personalities, look at the platform. Supreme Court. The Republicans have said they will elect constitutional judges. The Democrats have said they will elect progressive judges. If you need to know what that means, we can explain that later. We can have a conversation about it. There's about six or seven more issues that are on this pamphlet that are at the Welcome Center. There's other voter guides at the Welcome Center. This one, I think, is the best because it gives descriptions and references on all the issues. It's put out by the Faith and Life uh, Commission. Uh, Faith and Life, uh, Faith Research Council. Sorry. So, what do we do? Well, look what I found on the floor. You're probably wondering... What is, why did I get a clothespin today? This wasn't my idea. I stole it. Franklin Graham stood before us, what, about a month ago? 
And he said to all of us who were gathered, 8,200 people gathered for a prayer rally in Richmond. He said, look, it's a privilege to vote. And he said, even if you have to hold your nose. So we were on our way home. And Fonda said, (laughs) you don't think I'm taking the fall for this. (laughs) No, I'm just kidding. I can pick on Fonda a little bit. I'm not sure who said it. Somebody said, you know what? We ought to get everybody a clothespin. And um, now, you know, it's, it's comical. But there's a lot of truth in it. Because I want to encourage you this morning that just because the air is polluted, the political air is polluted, do not forsake the privilege that you have to cast your vote. Even if you have to hold your nose to go into that voting booth, go. All right? Please go. Now open your Bibles to Romans chapter 13. Did we order lunch? Karen? Yeah. Uh, Hey, thank you, Martha. Did you hear what Martha said? Martha said, well, you're feeding us meat now, so we'll be good. We'll behave. All right. This is not going to take long. Er. Romans 13.1. And we're going to read part of chapter 14. This is not going to need a lot of interpretation and commentary. We're going to let the Bible speak for itself. Romans 13, everyone, everybody say everyone. By the way, I'm reading in the New Living Translation. Everyone must submit to governing authorities. For all authority comes from God. And those in positions of authority have been placed there by God. So anyone who rebels against authority is rebelling against what God has instituted and they will be punished. For the authorities do not strike fear in people who are doing right, but in those who are doing wrong. Would you like to live without fear of the authority? Do what is right and they will honor you. The authorities are God's servants sent for your good. If you are doing wrong, of course, you should be afraid, for they have the power to punish you. They are God's servants sent for the very purpose of punishing those who do what is wrong. So you must submit to them, not only to avoid punishment, but also to keep a clear conscience. Pay your taxes to For these same reasons. For government workers need to be paid. They are serving God in what they do. Give to everyone what you owe them. Pay your taxes and government fees for those who collect them and give respect and honor to those who are in authority. Now I'm going to pause here because a lot of you have a lot of arguments going on in your head right now. And let you and the Holy Spirit work out that conversation. (laughs) Because I, I heard some of you, I heard it all the way up here. You said, why, it doesn't say I'm supposed to give them all my money. The Bible is talking about our attitude. Okay? We must have an attitude of submission. We must have a position of honor and respect. We must do what God, we must be uh, faithful to what God has set over us. Now, We could take more time this morning and I could take the scriptures and show you that this doesn't mean that you obey to the point of compromising the word of God. Okay? It's not what it says. It's not what it's saying. There's other places in the scripture where civil disobedience would be very appropriate. If our values are being challenged, 
But I think overall we need to get our mind wrapped around this because the political climate has been, I would say, very unsubmissive, uh, very cruel at times, very hateful. That's not the attitude for believers, according to Paul's writing in God's Word. In verse 8, Owe nothing to anyone except for your obligation to love one another. If you love your neighbor, you will fulfill the requirements of God's law. For the commandments say you must not commit adultery, you must not murder, you must not steal, you must not covet. These and other such commandments are summed up in this one commandment. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to others. So love fulfills the requirements of God's law. This is all the more urgent for you to know, for you know how late it is. Time is running out. Wake up, for, your, for our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. The night is almost gone. The day of salvation will, come, will soon be here. So remove your dark deeds like dirty clothes and put on the shining armor of right living. Because we belong to the day, we must live decent lives for all to see. Don't participate in the darkness of wild parties and drunkenness or in sexual promiscuity and immoral living or in quarreling and jealousy. Instead, clothe yourself with the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. And don't let yourself think about ways to indulge your evil desire. Pause here for a moment. Friend, we're going to go into the voting booth on Tuesday. We're going to vote. And those of you who can, you're going to come out and you're going to join us. For united we stand, together we pray. And we're going to clothe ourselves together as the people of God in the presence of Jesus. That's what the world needs to see. The world needs to see more of Jesus. Amen? That's our mission. And our mission is a mission of love, man. It's not a mission of hate. Hate what is evil. It doesn't say hate people. Hate what is evil. Love what is good. Verse 14, uh, chapter 14. I want you to skip down to um, let's see. Let's go to verse 14. I know and am convinced of the authority of the Lord Jesus that no food in and of itself is wrong to eat, but if someone believes it is wrong, then for that person it is wrong. And if another believer is distressed by what you eat, you are not acting in love if you eat it. Don't let your eating ruin someone uh, for whom Christ died. Then you will not be criticized for doing something you believe is good. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of what we eat or drink, but of living a life of goodness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. If you serve Christ with this attitude, you will please God, and others will approve of you too. So then let us aim for harmony in the church and try to build each other up. Don't tear apart the work of God over what you eat. Remember all foods are acceptable, but it is wrong to eat something if it makes another person stumble. It is better not to eat or drink wine or do anything else if it might cause another believer to stumble. You may believe there's nothing wrong with what you're doing, but keep, keep it between yourself and God. Blessed are those who don't feel guilty for doing something they have decided is right. But if you have doubts about whether or not you should eat something, you are sinning if you go ahead and do it. For you are not following your convictions. If you do anything you believe is not right, you are sinning. Now, I want you to know that the reason for reading that part of the Scripture is not to make an issue of what you eat or what you drink. What Paul is writing about, he says, look, how we behave in front of each other matters. And it matters a lot. And you may have strong convictions about something and someone believes something very different. He says, apply the law of love, my friend. 
I have said in other circles that I think a requirement, if I were king, <laughs> if I were president, I would require every Republican to hug a Democrat and a Democrat to hug a Republican before they cast their vote. Because after they cast their vote, we've all got to live together. We've all got to live together. And so, friend, if you find yourself, if you find hatred boiling up inside of you for someone who holds a different political position, or maybe they're thinking differently on a moral issue, and you say, I know, I know what you're saying. Well, what about the Word of God? Let me tell you what. In this room, there's a variety of opinion about a lot of things according to God's Word. And we're all on a journey to learn, and the Holy Spirit's the only one who can really convict us to the truth, right? We can help each other along. We can teach the Word of God. But if the Holy Spirit isn't the one doing the convicting, it's not going to change our mind. And so what we need to do is to pray more. We need to stand together. We need to be united as we stand. But together, my friend, we must pray. Worship team, come on up. We have got to find our way through this mess. And I believe that the law of love is definitely the starting place and it is definitely the ending place. We cannot forget about love. Amen?